Here we have my Amiga 1000 Phoenix motherboard and it is in its display case. This is something I built to show off an amazing piece of Australian computing history and a wonderful Commodore Amiga. I had the board with no case and while it was originally designed as a wholesale upgrade to an Amiga 1000 and belongs in an Amiga 1000 case even the creator realized that some of the uh, expansion slots that he included could mean that it would be mounted in some other kind of case and I've mounted it in a display case that I've made out of some polycarbonate sheeting sold as machine guard polycarbonate which should be static dissipative and it doesn't seem to attract dust and uh, various pieces of aluminium section so lots of angle and some rectangular hollow section the the board itself inside an Amiga 1000 case provides for a really high quality Commodore Amiga computing experience and for the purposes of exhibition from what I've seen people tend to take the lid off their computers which exposes the motherboard and the, the detail on it, the poetry and everything else. There are more photos and the details about the history on my blog benjaminsbench.wordpress.com but unless the internal floppy drive is removed this part here is obscured plus the ribbon cable and while it would be an extremely interesting exhibition um, the field of view is limited and the bottom is of course entirely obscured so having one of these boards with no case I made this display case the um, the board is a very interesting upgrade to the Amiga 1000 it provides for this expansion port here which I'd love something for maybe even just a, a CPU socket riser but um, I don't have anything to go in there. A standard Amiga 2000 Zorro slot and over here a standard Amiga 2000 video slot which has currently got an RGB to HDMI board in there but no Raspberry Pi Zero to power it because of the global shortage. That will be a great way to add high quality HDMI to this computer and make it um, very easy to connect up to all sorts of modern displays. I didn't change the actual board much. I had to configure all of the jumper wires and switches I didn't have those I put a removable coin cell in here the original was soldered to the board and I replaced these capacitors here with brand new electrolytics all of the yellow blocks on there are capacitors too but I think they are a plastic film capacitor with no electrolyte in them to leak a um, great joy for anyone who has ever owned and maintained an Amiga 1200 or 4000 there are a couple of electrolytics up there on the audio section which I didn't replace. They don't see the same sort of ripple current as the ones for the main power connector here. And goodness me, um, going from the socket on the back of the uh, machine that's connected up through this aviation style connector, a GX something something, getting, getting these cables to the right spots on the board was nerve wracking. At one stage I got an original Omega 1000 power supply drew what I measured on its connector covered that up measured what I'd made here then compared the two drawings I, I, I checked and rechecked so many times because wired up wrong it would create absolute havoc and may even burn up traces on the board it's um 5 volts 12 volts minus 5 volts ground and a 50 hertz tick signal derived from the mains that's not used here thanks to that jumper over there. So the way this is currently configured we have a range of different switches around the machine which we will go to in turn. We have two different kickstart ROMs, the, the ROMs that hold the software and Amiga loads upon startup um, 1.3 and 3.1 and we have a RAM expansion in the side here, a 2 megabyte RAM expansion, although I do have an accelerator to go in here um, with a ribbon cable back to the CPU socket, but I need to replace the uh, pins.
on the um, part that plugs into the socket. The ones on there are quite large. I need to um, put in these. No, they're not them. They're the right angle ones. Anyway, oh, these ones. They're, they're round pins. And then I should be able to put an accelerator in the side here with a massive ram expansion, but there's no hurry. So, I mentioned that with this setup you can see the top really clearly, fairly unobscured. Um, the ribbon cable over here goes to a hard drive emulator, a SCSI hard drive emulator. I've left the cable a bit long, there is a second socket under there and I need to be able to get to it. So, let's turn this upside down. And this is a rare sight really, the, the bottom of one of these boards and it's worth doing while the top of the board has a lot of details in the silk screen, the, the sort of the printing you can do on the board, in, including the, the poem Desiderata and, and other things, um, again details on my, on my um, blog at benjaminsbench.wordpress.com, the, the, the details on the bottom of the board are included with um, traces, uh, the same as the ones that carry um, electrical signals. And there's some branding and some thanks to the original subscribers. There's some indication this might be the first uh, confirmed crowdsource funded IT project. But the, the thanks to the subscribers down here. And it's on the bottom of the board that you can really start to see my construction methods. Th these holes for these 15mm standoffs to make sure there's room for the expansion port and so on had to be in exactly the right spot I think I needed to be within half a millimetre of on centre uh, at worst um, and they're, they're right, they're, they're absolutely spot on um, it was an extremely exacting process there's also a black circle here, that's a standoff that's a press fit into one of those round holes on the board and 15 millimetres in height because this chip here, if it ever needs to be replaced, requires quite a bit of force. And there's an edge connector here, and this whole section of the board was not particularly well supported, so I, I added that um, Delrin plug in there to support the board. All of these angle pieces were originally attached with super glue, and with say these ones where the leg is drilled and tapped, and there's a clearance hole in the angle. I super glued the angle on with the tap size hole in the angle, 3.2 millimeters for a M4 times 0.8 thread. So I then copied that 3.2 millimeter hole into the aluminium and then opened up the hole in the angle for clearance. And the parts are stamped so that they can go back together in the way they were originally super glued together, but they're accurate enough so that save for one I goofed by about, I don't know, maybe nearly two millimetres on one hole, I don't know how. But apart from that, the, the parts are probably perfectly interchangeable. So, looking at the front, we have a joystick port here, which I'll just route back around to the actual joystick port. Um, I mentioned an accelerator board, it will actually overlap that hole and it's also useful strain relief. I, I don't expect the mouse cord to get tugged on but joystick ports, especially if I'm exhibiting this and have a joystick connected, could far more easily receive a, a sharp tug and would be far more likely mounted here to simply unplug. Over on this side there is a switch which disables auto booting of the hard drive which means that the computer will try and boot from a floppy and if there's no floppy present you just get one of those Amiga insert floppy screens. Quite lovely. Um, it's nice to see them occasionally. And this is a power LED which I configured to be the same as the power LEDs on a Phoenix upgraded 1000 as per the uh, as, as, as per the, 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 the manual. Um, this um, original copy from the olden days. I thumbed through that a lot. I perhaps should have used a printout copy, but it was so nice to use the genuine article, even though it was a little bit out of date. The LED has red and green, and normally 
when the computer's on they're both on and makes it orange. When the hard drive's active, the red light is turned off and the light goes green. Um, apparently, if there's a major fault, the light can go red. I'm pleased to say that's not something I have ever seen. Over on this side, you get a better look at the, uh, the um, SCSI emulator, the Small Computer Systems Interface emulator. It's um, an SD to SCSI. It isn't particularly happy with the SCSI controller on the Phoenix motherboard. Uh, I only got it working reliably by um, not using the onboard ROM beyond boot and putting an updated version of the ROM. Well, there's no updated version of the ROM officially, but using updated software to run the computer once it had started. And that's been great. Um, it's been super reliable ever since I did that. And then over here we see these three momentary action buttons and they're connected back to the HDMI adapter in the video slot. Um, and one of them is, a, is a, grabs the screen, like a screenshot, which um, will be super useful um, for my blog and, and for some other purposes I have in mind for that. Going around to the back, and we'll start over here. There is the um, power input and HDMI socket. There's a socket on both sides and the HDMI output will go on there. It's really nice strain relief. Then there are connectors for video, parallel, floppy um, and serial. Not in that order. Across the back of the computer. This is the keyboard socket. It's um, like a telephone socket, a 4P, 4C. And I can unplug this cable and and uh, plug an Amiga 1000 keyboard in there. But I'm unlikely to do that. What I've done instead is uh, put this socket in on the cable, which is the kind of socket you would normally expect to find on an Amiga 2000 or 3000. And it's the kind of socket that most of the um, adapters use to enable connection of a modern keyboard to an Amiga. <clears throat> and that's that's what I do. Clearly this is no kind of Amiga in concourse condition. These switches here are to select between the two kickstart ROMs and to choose to boot or not boot off an external floppy drive. I didn't put a floppy on the board, it covers too much up and the ribbon cable gets in the way. Um, but I can boot off a floppy with this switch over here and indeed perhaps just as usefully I can not boot off a floppy um, with um, the switch over on that side. So I can have a, a floppy in a virtual floppy or a real floppy in a floppy disk drive that is bootable but if I've got the switch over there I, I, I still boot from the the hard drive which can be extremely useful. There's also a locking a ring here that I'll use for locking it up. I I hope to take it well I, I built this to take to an exhibition in April and I hope to take it to some other places and it would be nice to be able to sort of nip off to um, get a cup of coffee or something and and have the computer uh, tacked in place. I mean, it, it's it's a valuable thing, but the amount of the, the tens and tens of hours that I've put into um, getting this display case sorted out and figuring out how to get the software running reliably, to lose that would be would be genuinely heartbreaking. Um, the coin cell should last quite well. I did think about a smaller one in there, but it, it doesn't obscure any of the writing, and the legs on it only needed the slightest tweak to line up with some of the existing holes in the board. So that's the uh, Phoenix board. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed the uh, slightly better audio and videography in this video. Um, as, I, as I say in the blah, I'm, I'm not looking to to be a, uh, a major force amongst YouTubers. I'm just having a bit of fun and it allows me to have a, a bit of a rant to camera instead of uh, ranting at family and friends who probably uh, <laughs> You probably appreciate the fact that I'm doing this instead. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the comments or head on over to the blog.
I'll uh, make sure there's a link to the blog in the video description.